Hello, everybody. <laughs> Already screwed it up. I'm sorry. Um, turn that down. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to uh, be here, sort of, um, and uh, see everybody. Let me just try and turn this down. Okay. Better. Yeah. All right. So I think we're probably almost ready. I'll just give it another minute. I'm going to queue up my slide deck and um, yeah, we'll be ready to go in a few seconds. Okay, um, I think we've got a group. Uh, again, I'm Brian Knaus. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you all for joining. I would much rather love to be able to see everybody in person and uh, have conversations on technology, open source, Linux systems with this group in person. But um, you know, considering we're in a once in a century plague and apocalypse, sometimes we gotta make best with the situation we have. So with that in mind, I will queue up my screen share. You should be able to see me. We're gonna jump into the deck. Um, I do have a Q&A box. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. I, I really like discussions like this being conversational and not kind of you know just talking about slides and paragraphs. I find that so boring when I attend it myself. So I like um you know having a discussion about technology when i'm doing my screen share i can't see the q a thing so maybe what i'll do is i'll kind of run through this um more quickly and leave like 10 or 15 minutes at the end if there's any conversation if not we'll keep talking i'll share more photos or something um, and we'll just kind of see how it goes so um i'm brian Knaus. Uh, i'm the co-founder and ceo of project owl um and today we're gonna to be talking about open source Internet of Things networks to make an impact around the world uh, with Project Owl. So first, what should you be doing during this presentation? So I don't know the archetypes of everybody uh, who, who will be joining us. Um, I want to get creative about IoT and mesh networking. Um, and I want you to get inspired about things you can do with IoT and, and some of the next capabilities of this technology that's gonna usher in, um, I, I believe a real incredible few years ahead of networking, connectivity, and edge computing. Um, with that said, Project Owl, we are a tiny company. We're very young, but we do have some extra electronics and swag I would love to give to some of you. Uh, what I would ask is, go ahead, if you're interested, if you like playing with IoT, you like coding, Arduino, anything like that, or you just want a t-shirt, shoot me an email with your name, uh, a little bit of background about yourself and maybe what you're trying to do with some IoT. Um, and if quantities permitting, if there aren't too many people, we'll send you some stuff and get you set up with uh, some cluster ducks, and uh, we'd love to feature your work on the cluster duck protocol website, feature it in our Slack. So just keep that in mind as we're going through. Uh, I'll have more links to all this um, as we get there, uh, if we need. Cool, so we're gonna start with uh, the origins of Project Owl in this discussion. We're gonna go through the state of the Internet of Things, uh, dig into a little bit of interoperable IoT firmwares, uh, what the cluster duck protocol actually is. And then we're going to conclude this looking towards the future with what's the experience and how do we build a global open source development community to leverage the incredible millions of developers around the world to make game changing technology that can help uh, connect the people, places and things we care about most. So let's get started. The origins of Project Owl, the nest in a way in the cluster up protocol. So who are we and what do we do? Well, 
the best way to start, in my opinion, is to go back to Texas in August 2017. Now, some of you may have been in Texas at the time. Some of you um, may have been in other places affected by similar events. Hurricane Harvey was one of the largest hurricanes to hit the United States. And this photo doesn't really show the scale of the event. But what I love about this photo is it does show uh, the enormous magnitude of water, almost an unimaginable, uh, maybe you can imagine the unimaginable amount of water. If, you know, Houston's pretty flat and it's getting six feet of water on top of that, um, this was really a, a, an unprecedented amount of water that was dumped upon this region. Just a couple weeks after Hurricane Irma uh, ripped through the Caribbean, a couple weeks after that, one of the most devastating hurricanes in history, Hurricane Maria, uh, uh, passed through Puerto Rico and the other Caribbean islands. And you may also notice just days before that happened, Hurricane Jose hit the East Coast. A really terrible time uh, on the East Coast in the Caribbean for natural disasters, particularly hurricanes. Uh, this photograph of solar panel damage, I, I think really encapsulates what hurricanes are capable of and what happens in Puerto Rico. Uh, solar energy farms are, uh, uh, I think, a modern manifestation of technology today. And you can see here the hurricane ripped through it like it was paper going through a shredder, just complete and utter devastation. And then of course, not even a year after that, barely a year after that, Hurricane Florence hit the US East Coast dumping an enormous amount of water, a gigantic hurricane uh, by, by modern standards. So if you encountered any of these events, if you've heard of these, been through anything similar, you might notice these four in particular I noted are, are quite unique in the history of Atlantic hurricanes in the United States. Um, if we look at a list from Wikipedia of the costliest Atlantic hurricanes in history, you'll notice three of the four highest happened within a month of each other in 2017. If you add Florence a year later to that list, this accounts for almost $300 billion in damages in just one year in just one specific part of the world from just one type of natural disaster. So really uh, a truly massive amount of destruction um, of, uh, and a, uh, a toll on human life as well as uh, uh, the economic uh, infrastructure we're used to that, that powers our modern society. So this is terrible. What do we do about this? This was a question Project Owl was asking ourselves in the summer of 2018 after a few of our founding members had just been through these scenarios. Uh, Hurricane Harvey in Houston, one of our original developers, Hurricane Florence in North Carolina. I live in New York City, I'm not there right now, but Hurricane Sandy still to this day, six years later is shutting down subway lines in New York City for repairs. It's pretty incredible. So what do we do? We felt that we needed to acquire and share more data. It sounds simple. And why does accumulating and distributing more data help during a disaster? What is, how does this help us? We're still gonna get hit, right? What does this do? So to illustrate what I, I think we're, we're capable of as a society, particularly with technology, I wanna show you a couple slides. Um, one is, this comes from Mary Meeker's Internet Trends Report, some of you may have heard of. Um, talks a lot about you know, uh, growth, uh, expansion of the internet. Uh, one characteristic of this I find particularly interesting is the growth of data. And there, there's two uh, characteristics of this chart we're looking at, which is the growth of data and the growth of that data that is structured, the ratio of that data that is structured. So, Clearly growing exponentially, um, the amount of data produced as well as the amount of data that's structured, and that's really important to inform artificial intelligence technologies, machine learning algorithms that eat this data uh, to provide their insights, analytics, pattern matching, all sorts of things like this. Um, and we think this can make a big impact in disaster response. Um, and to showcase, many of you are, I'm sure are familiar with AI, machine learning techniques, technologies. Um, one of my favorite ways to describe what I think AI is good at is with this. 
This is a vitamin water kiwi strawberry. I don't even know if they make it anymore. But um, when I was in college, I used to drink this all the time. On one hand, it's the best flavor. Kiwi strawberry was amazing. But on the other, they called it focus. And I thought, you know, if I'm in college, uh, if I can just drink this and be more focused, well, that's, that's a pretty easy win. Um, needless to say, I don't think it worked, but I always found it so interesting, the paragraph on the side here. And if you want to go ahead and read it yourself, I'll read a little part. But what it says is, and I have not memorized this, a recent study found that it doesn't matter what order the letters of a word are in. The only important thing is that the first and last letters are in the correct position. Unfortunately, that's not the case for everything in life. Sometimes the in-between stuff matters. Imagine if you only put on your hat and shoes before going out. That's why we made this product. It's got vitamin A, an important nutrient for your eyes as they focus on everything, the middle stuff included. So take a sip, no really take a sip. We're waiting there, now you have a bit of focus. So if you're looking at this, why did I bring this up? What's so interesting here is they jumbled up all the letters and you'd think at face value, this would be extremely hard to read. But as you're going through it, you realize your brain does an incredible job interpolating what goes where. This is the type of thing that the human brain is really good at understanding and figuring out subconsciously. But maybe you can imagine this is the type of activity intellectual activity that computers up until very recently would have been a monumental task to overcome. Maybe if you're a programmer, could you imagine writing code like this and having it all just work out in the end? That would be crazy. So what does this mean? Why, why does growing data mean anything to us? Why does this have an implication in natural disasters? Well, maybe you've seen this photo before. This is a million water bottles on a runway in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. All of these went to waste. Now, I'm not using this example to criticize FEMA and first responders. Um, many times these folks are giving their lives to help people in need. Um, certainly Puerto Rico and the Puerto Rican communities we've spoken to have criticisms of the ways this was handled. But what I wanna speak more to is not so much the mistake that was made here, but maybe we all can empathize with and understand how something like this would happen. This is a human mistake, unfortunately, at a very large magnitude of inaccurately allocating resources, not understanding, coordinating, and communicating with the folks in need and the leaders in those communities, and not able to organize where resources should go, to who needs it, to where they are, to when they need it. We can understand that as a human, you could easily make a mistake there. Unfortunately, this one was at massive scale. Uh, but this is, again, like the vitamin water, where this might be a problem that humans aren't incredibly well suited to solve intellectually. This is the type of organizational data manipulation effort that computers are really great at keeping track of and not forgetting that there's a million water bottles on here and we should cut that in half and, and allocate it somewhere else. So again, talking about our origins, what does this mean for Project Allen? Why am I talking about hurricanes when we were supposed to be talking about IoT networks around the world? Well, this was the inspiration for us to go and build interconnected wireless technologies that can help bring back communications and networking in places that have lost it, particularly after the events of a, of a natural disaster like what happened in Puerto Rico. So to dig into how, how we entered this market and where we were when we started, we were looking at the current state of the Internet of Things. And uh, there are many ways we can look at this from many perspectives. Um, and uh, I, I think just one quote to generalize, McKinsey and company did, it did a... Uh, 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 um, put out research that suggested the Internet of Things presents an enormous opportunity to transform the way we live and do business and will have an economic impact of between $4 trillion and $11 trillion by 2025. Now, <laughs> these kinds of statistics I always find kind of interesting because, you know, $4 trillion, nobody knows what that looks like, right? I've never seen a $4 trillion bill or a stack of cash in the United States. But what it does show is the generalization that this is going to be uh, uh, operating at a very large scale and drive a lot of economic growth during this near-term time frame. 
So IoT will play a part in almost everybody's life and uh, drive economic growth from manufacturing to technology, healthcare, disaster response. So I pulled this slide, uh, maybe bring this more down to earth, especially to the technologists and programmers on board. I pulled this from Particles 2019 State of IoT. And I thought this was an awesome overview of um, what's actually hard about IoT. What are we building? What are the things that people are really focused on today? So you'll see some of the stuff we've all done, collected, stored data, visualized data. That, that's kind of easy, easy to build those solutions, easy to work with. And as you move forward, you look at the hard end, reducing bandwidth consumption, delivering software updates to edge devices, debugging unhealthy devices. I can certainly say, uh, as one of the, the developers who built the Clusterduck protocol, um, these are very hard things to do, and we focus a lot of time and effort on delivering software updates, edge devices, OTA as we call it, over the air, optimizing bandwidth. And uh, uh, I have to chuckle at debugging on healthy devices. I think that's a very professional way of saying a lot of the electronics we get are crap. Um, but certainly our experience aligns with that. I've got a, one of the boards I'll show later, a TTGO T-Beam for any IOTers out there. These come from China. Um, these are actually pretty good. Some of the other boards we use though, the, the consistency and quality is, is very hard to gauge. And you can imagine how frustrating it is when, you know, a bunch of young developers go out to Puerto Rico to um, deploy some mesh networks and they realize half their devices aren't transmitting. We don't know why, we don't know how, we're not that smart. Uh, unfortunately, it takes a while to figure that out. So, if you go on to the internet and you look up IoT devices, for those developers, you might recognize some of these. Uh, people who haven't built IoT devices or Arduinos or played around with Raspi, some of these may be new. Um, you don't need to know what these are. Uh, in the top left, you have the Helltech ESP32. We use these at Project Owl a lot. We have the PyCom Low Pies. Uh, low Pi 4s, actually. We've played around with those. A Raspberry Pi in the top right with a Lora hat on it. Um, these very easy to get off Amazon. You can even get in the bottom left a TTGO T Beam. And what's just fantastic about the state of IoT is if I order two of these, one from Amazon one day and another from Amazon the next, or one from AliExpress, I might even get a T Beam that's actually a different board. It looks different, like the one in the center middle. Uh, you just never know. It's so exciting. Or if you're crazy and and you love putting yourself through hell, you can buy the. Uh, Laura modules yourself and wire up an entire board on your own. So the point is there's a million different ways you can execute building an IoT device and there are many, many more than what you can see on here um, out there that you can use. And like this little guy, many times it feels like you have to be nothing short of a wizard to be able to make them work. And this was our experience for the first two years, whether it's quality control, consistency, challenges in the firmware, uh, it, it seems to be a combination of expertise, hard work, sweat labor, and just a little bit of magic to get these things working at the end of the day. So this brings us to 2018. And again, Project Owl had been through hurricanes. We saw the destruction. Um, and, and what were we going to do about it? So in 2018, I got a call from a mentor of mine at IBM who said, hey, we're putting on a global hackathon. It's called the IBM Call for Code. And this asks developers to uh, build things that um, can help communities prepare for, deal with, or respond to natural disasters. So with all this in mind, we immediately uh, uh, jumped into the community in New York City where I live. There's an incredible meetup community for all different types of technologies. So we went to a Things Network meetup in New York City in July 2018. This is, as far as I can tell on my phone, the very first photo of anything I or anybody on my team ever did with Project Owl. And what you'll see is a small group of folks, some we still keep in touch with to this day. Uh, a lot of IoT boards on the table. You'll notice my Intel Edison and Galileo that I still to this day don't really know how to program on. Uh, we've iterated far beyond that, but th these were really our first tastes was just going to these, um, these meetups and these communities, getting as deep in the weeds as possible to understand how you can leverage this technology leverage open source technologies on top of that uh, to solve problems specifically that you want to set out and, and achieve. Three months later, 
we were very fortunate that we were selected from over 100,000 developers from 156 nations as the global grand prize winners of the IBM Call for Code. And this was a very humbling moment. It provided us with expertise, uh, mentorship from IBM, certainly the support of a large organization that's been around for many, many years. Uh, that That's all uh, incredibly valuable to go from, you know, a couch in Brooklyn developing on your sublime text on your computer to the next stage to get this solution out in the world to the point where we have ducks running um, all around the world. And um, it, uh, Um, this also resulted in a group of five IBM Corporate Service Corps members being selected um, uh, uh, to join us for a pilot in Puerto Rico in March. And they came from Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Israel. Uh, on the left side there, you see Maria Masiar from uh, Canada. She was a design and UX expert as well as a first responder. Um, Omer Arad from IBM Research on the right, he is uh, uh, based in Israel, has done a lot of very interesting IoT projects in the past. And Nick Foy, our CTO in the middle, in the back. That is on the beach of Loiza in Puerto Rico. And you can see one of the very first ducks, uh, looks like duck number five here. Um, our first prototypes of a duck, you can see a battery pack and a Helltech ESP32 just inside there sitting on the sand in Louisa. And this was our first time ever testing this uh, in Puerto Rico. And to give you a better sense of what we did there, I have a short video. I'm just gonna check the, make sure everything's, okay, everything looking good so far. All right, I'm gonna play a video. Hopefully you can hear this. Um, it's only a minute long. I'll link it in the chat if there are any problems. What happens after, what happens after, there's no way Maria, millions of Puerto Ricans struggled to return to their normal lives. Rebuilding without internet only made it more difficult. During a hurricane, the chaos means the formation of different bases. You need a solution to help coordinate resources and to organize and communicate. That's Project OWL's founder. Their solution is a hardware and software disaster management system built on open source technology. It's based on cheap, durable, low frequency Wi Fi devices that connect to each other. That quickly reestablishes connectivity when a disaster area goes off the grid, a mobile app on network. Then, civilians can connect to first responders in real time, so emergency services can deploy where they need to. That influx of data is managed through Project Alpha software, which leverages the power of AI and DMI to Project Owl runs the Nautical Intelligence Challenge and are now deploying the technology to the IBM code and How will your code and your ideas make a difference? What will you do? So I uh I hope you could hear that. If not, um, I apologize. I'll make sure this, this link is shared. But that was a brief overview of our pilot, um, what some of our technology does, and uh, how these duck links connect together. And I'll talk a little bit more about the architecture in a moment of our technology, what we actually build, what's the clustered up protocol, and what it actually does. Um, so with that in mind, let's dig into the development of an interoperable IoT firmware. And the key word there is interoperable. Why is interoperability so necessary in this world of IoT? And how can this enable us, again, to deploy IoT communication sensor networks all around the world? Why is interoperability a key pillar of that? Let's go back to our IoT device selection here, our Heltex, our Lopies, our Raspies, our TTGOs, our TTGO sort of version variant and then our basic LoRa chipsets. Now imagine here 
uh, uh, to make an analogy that instead of these new networks based on these IoT devices that you can talk to to use to communicate basic uh, messaging capabilities or provide sensor data, imagine if these networks that we'd be running through these devices are more like the networks that we currently leverage. So to paint a picture, imagine if, you know, you're on AT&T, I'm on AT&T, but I, I couldn't connect and, and, and interoperate, message with, send data to people on these other networks. That, if that was the state of telecom 4G LTE, that would really suck. It would be very, very difficult and significantly reduce our ability to coordinate, communicate, not just with loved ones or friends, but especially in the case of a natural disaster, if these networks were not interoperable. So too with IoT, making sure that all the IoT devices out there, more than anyone could ever singularly build for, uh, write a firmware to, uh, open source is a big component of that. It needs to be able to interoperate with all of the devices that already exist and additionally, all the ones that will exist in the future that we don't even know about yet. So to do this, we went back to uh, the heart of where this was all inspired from and where we wanted to lay our, our foundations of our technical uh, technology and our networks. And we went back to Puerto Rico. We developed a cohort of about a dozen students and administrators at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaquez. And right now, this is currently where our largest active network is operating. We have 17 solar powered ducts. I have one uh, here. If, if you can't see my screen, I'll show it to you when I'm back on. Um, ducts operating on rooftops, on trees throughout the university. Uh, we've been planning to return for several months now, certainly over the last few months that has been uh, stunted by global events. Uh, but we will continue expanding, saturating, and adding to that network over time. This relationship was also exceptionally valuable because it uh, uh, created an open source community on the ground. So these students and administrators are helping us develop this firmware that runs this communications and sensor network at their school. And when earthquakes struck Puerto Rico in January of this past year, Claro Fiber went down, the internet network throughout the island. Electricity also went down, but our ducts did continue to operate in a local network capacity on land. So we thought we were going to have until the fall hurricane season to uh, continue to update and, and uh, prepare for the next disaster, but it came even earlier than we expected. So um, while we don't wish for those events, it was good to see that our devices worked uh, as intended. Um, one of the things we've learned developing IoT and one of the challenges we've seen is if anyone on this uh, discussion has um, built radio devices, uh, engaged radio engineering, worked on LoRa, 915 megahertz or any frequency band really, you'll understand how deep of a rabbit hole of knowledge and technology and engineering this really is. Um, what you're seeing here is one of our first tests in Comarillo. It's a very densely, uh, um, uh, it's very dense foliage, almost a jungle in the middle of Puerto Rico with a small town kind of seated in the heart. So we set up a duck network, realized a couple things. One, dense foliage dramatically inhibits radio communications, as does heat and humidity. Uh, this was learned through long, sweaty experience on the ground in the blazing sun. But you'll also see here uh, a lot of repetitive traffic. This is um, what had actually happened in our firmware at the time was uh, one of our ducks malfunctioned, and we started DDoSing ourselves, what we've uh, aptly named the duck DOS in our mesh network. So problems that had to be accounted for. And you can see in our what we call the OWL data management system, this is an incident management system that provides dots on a map. Uh, the cluster duck networks on the ground share data up to the cloud OWL DMS, and we can see that data coming through. So if there's any communications sensor data on these networks, this is where that data lands, and you can imagine a first responder, government official can be watching anywhere in the world with an internet connection to get a sense and a picture of what's going on on the ground. So I feel obligated at this point to also explain in more detail exactly what a clustered up network is, what do our devices do, and how do they interact with each other. So a duck may be a TTGO, it might be a Helltech, um, it's got a couple things on it, a LoRa radio, 915 megahertz. 
It also has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and in some cases a GPS. These technologies make it able to connect to your standard consumer electronics, such as a phone or a laptop. With a duck on, you can connect to its Wi-Fi network. And you know, kind of like if you've ever been to a Starbucks, you join the network and you get a, um, uh, a portal that asks you to agree to the terms. Well, very similarly, we leverage that portal, but instead of asking you to agree to our terms, we provide a, a short form where you can submit information about your scenario. So imagine you're in Puerto Rico after a flood, you see a duck link network on your phone, you can pull that up and submit information, who you are, where you are, what you need, food, uh, you know, financial assistance, um, emergency services. Uh, you can even submit messages, tweet, uh, about a Twitter tweet worth a length of, of a message, kind of like a text message that then permeates through the network. Duck links are the edge nodes and they communicate with a mama duck, which is kind of like a central hub of that mesh network you see on the screen. Um, both of these devices may be identical pieces of hardware. We just manipulate the firmware just a little bit to optimize routing throughout the network, particularly as that network grows. So as data is flowing through the, the cluster duck network, what will happen is eventually that data will reach a Papa duck, which is again, might be an identical piece of hardware. The only difference is Papa Duck is connected to the cloud. So Papa Duck is a network gateway that might be connected through ethernet, might be connected through Wi-Fi, in some cases might even be connected through satellite connection. And Papa Duck forwards data up to that OWL data management system, if you recall seeing those dots on the map. Uh, and that's how we flow data from areas that might not have any electricity or communications from a duck link to a mama duck, ultimately to a Papa Duck, and then up to the cloud where it can be viewed by those who need to see that information. And maybe you can imagine, you know, we've got four ducks here, five duck links, a mama duck and papa duck. Maybe you can imagine as we continue to iterate and develop our goal, our hope is that we can go to places like Puerto Rico and expand this from one cluster duck network to many that can all connect together. And even if you lose some nodes during a hurricane, the others continue operating around it um, to share data and do what, uh, uh, we wanted to do when we came up with OWL, which is actually an acronym for Organization, Whereabouts, and Logistics. And going back to a comment I made earlier, this is why acquiring, sharing, and representing data, particularly in the context of a natural disaster, is so critical to helping communities respond. And again, the cluster duck network, duck links are... Uh, evolve from duck links to deployed in clusters that of course forms the cluster duck network. So in 18 months, uh, we've come a long way, learned a lot of things, overcome a lot of challenges. Uh, and that's the result of largely many deployments uh, in the last year alone, six trips to Puerto Rico, as well as deployments in Georgia and Texas in New York City and Connecticut um, in Massachusetts, uh, tests in Australia, and hopefully elsewhere around the world. Um, we've built many iterations, including a couple more I'm going to show you today. We've also created YouTube content uh, showing how our ducklings work that garnered almost 1.5 million views. And our 500, nearly 500 member open source community is active on Slack that anyone can join and I'll provide uh, a link for that in a moment. Here you can see our latest duck link. So inside of there might be a Helltech ESP32, an 18650 battery or a TTGO. And um, yeah, handheld, you can stick it to a wall, very easy to use, one button on off. Um, and what this provides when you turn it on is again, that wireless network, like a router, or like a Starbucks Wi-Fi. And then whenever data comes in over Wi-Fi from someone's phone or a laptop, it transmits that data over LoRa to any ducks in range. And that LoRa range can be anywhere, you know, in line of sight outdoors in optimal conditions, one to two kilometers between ducks um, in, in the environment of Puerto Rico, maybe something a little bit closer to a couple hundred meters between ducks. So four, and let me check to make sure we're still all good. Looks good to me over here. So we will keep rolling. Um, the fourth and final act of this discussion was really the focus of moving forward and how do we build a global open source development community to make 
IoT electronics around the world that can provide mesh networking, particularly in the context when all other networking and communications are offline, which again might happen from any number of hurricanes that seem to be increasing in intensity to wildfires to uh, uh, just uh, the nature of underdeveloped nations that don't have this telecom capability, or even, as it were, a global pandemic is able to wreak havoc on our infrastructure. So to start, um, in March 2020, I was extremely excited that we released the ClusterDuck protocol as an official open source project alongside the Linux Foundation. So Project OWL was the original developers of this protocol, but we believed it was uh, extremely valuable uh, to the communities we want to serve to release this as an open source project. Um, if you want to learn more, head to clusterduckprotocol.org, and there you can find the code, which resides on GitHub. We've got a document that teaches you how to make a duck, um, and some YouTube videos as well, um, and of course, links to uh, Code and Response, IBM's uh, 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 organization that has supported us, the Linux Foundation and Project OWL. There's also links there to join on our Slack. This website also showcases the main development efforts, so if you're interested in any part of it, uh, maybe you're a great dev in network protocols. You can find some work that's ongoing there and poke your head in. Maybe you're not a great developer. You're just inspired or you want to support uh, communities trying to become more resilient. We, we really engage all of these personalities. It's a, it's a very holistic effort, and it's not just about getting, uh, you know, assembling the nerds like myself who love writing code, but we need people of all types uh, to help us support these communities in need. So we have a very dynamic slack of a, a lot of different folks from all over the world. Um, on that website, you'll also see some of the early variants of the protocol. Um, we've got 10 projects hand counting, and there are quite a more uh, in development from disco ducks to detector ducks to solar ducks to cluster flocks to duck ducks to space ducks. Um, we very much enjoy our puns. We love names. So if you have ideas, please email us, join our Slack. We want to hear about it. Um, or if you have ideas for a new type of IoT device, particularly one that needs to leverage a mesh network for sensing or um, some sort of motion, geospatial, geo, geospatial GPS-based, accelerometer-based, any type of communications, we, we love to engage new ideas and continue to expand the frontier of just what you can do with wireless IoT technology. Um, so one of the last things I want to address is why did we do this? Why did we open source? So again, inspired from the events in Puerto Rico and Houston and North Carolina and the terrible natural disasters around the world, we felt, you know, we can't stop the natural disasters as much as it would be really fun to sit here and, and speculate on technologies that can maybe blunt the energy uh, imparted by a hurricane. Um, these are many, many millions of dollars and years down the road. Uh, so we felt the single best thing we could do was provide a technology that can help people as effectively as possible organize uh, and provide whereabouts and logistics when these events do happen. And one key component of that was open sourcing this firmware technology. And we did that because we wanted to reach all the places in the world that we were not. This is our UPRM team at University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez. Um, again, dozen students and administrators, folks who just came together to help us develop this firmware technology. We also deployed together. You can see a solar duck in the background there. Uh, 17 of those were deployed on the university. And not only did we want to connect with these communities around the world and support them, but we also wanted to distribute the engineering effort. We accept that, you know, I'm, I'm a nerd. I love building stuff on the computer. There's nothing that has ever excited me more in life than just building incredible technology that makes people say, wow. But I don't have a degree in computer science and I certainly don't have a degree or PhD in radio engineering or firmware protocols or electrical engineering. These are very complicated tasks and you need uh, experts from all over the world, wherever they may reside, to be able to overcome the technical hurdles you need to get these solutions up and running in sometimes very remote environments. And you can see here several of our UPRM colleagues. On the right is Yazet Sepulveda. He, he leads the group on the ground. He's a senior, I believe, and um, just an incredible individual contributing to this technology that we're then taking not just from Puerto Rico, 
but establishing these networks all over the world. And as a result, our Slack channel has grown from five to, again, almost uh, 500 across six continents and 20 time zones in 18 months. We invite everyone from all walks of life, whether you're a developer or you've never written a piece of code in your life, uh, we, we really love talking about this effort, responding to natural disasters, improving community resilience, and then, of course, building incredible technology. So if any of that is inspiring to you, uh, you can join our Slack. You don't need any approval or anything. Poke your head and say hello at projectowl.com, project-owl.com slash Slack. Um, and I just wanted to show you, finally, a, a solar duck have I've been building and why that's uh, very useful. This was yesterday, me building the internals to a solar duck. You can see why an open source community would be helpful to someone who is using hot glue to insulate his wiring. And I'm, I'm sure there are some comments on this, but I just want to say my hot glue skills are quite exceptional and it works great. And there it is. I took this photo this morning. I'm holding the solar duck here. Um, that is solar powered, off grid, off network, wireless communication. So establishing a uh, small network here in Massachusetts where I am at this time. Um, we've also developed a few new products. Uh, or, or should I say new implementations are of our open source firmware. Uh, one of them is the Popeye. This is a Papa Duck running on a Raspberry Pi. And then naturally we added a screen to it to make the Popeye pad. I'm sure a copyright lawsuit is incoming. So to end this, this discussion, and I want to leave a few minutes for uh, questions and, and such. Um, Let's look at a little bit about the future of the cluster duck protocol. What are we really interested in doing? Taking our networks from the 30 permanent solar power devices we currently have in Puerto Rico to 100 to 500 to thousands of devices running all over the world powered by the sun. We want to be the number one integrator of technologies. And what that means is all these different IoT devices, we talked about the word interoperability before, uh, different communications technologies, different telcos, different networks, different smartphones. All of these things need to be integrated together. Um, you can imagine if, if you exist in a walled garden, um, and maybe there's some business cases for that, but in the context of disaster response and community resilience, that's really not a, a good position to hold. And we want to continue to build towards being the best integrator of technology uh, in the industry or in the world. Um, particularly in mesh networking. And that happens on a software side, that happens on a firmware side, that happens on a radio side. So really thinking about all these different things we can integrate into this technology. And who knows what heights we can reach. This is a volcano in Indonesia where one of the original ducks, I believe lucky duck number 13 here. Uh, again, you can see the battery pack and the uh, uh, incredibly well-assembled Helltech inside of this cheap plastic case. Uh, on a volcano in Indonesia, from there all the way to 100,000 feet in space. So we've done networks on Earth. We've also done networks off them. And Space Duck 1 had several sensors and communications technologies. This is a prototype, but I think it sets a foundation for some incredible testing and networking capacity we want to do in some really unique locations to provide that networking and communications to places that don't have it. And who knows where that could lead us. Let's go populate the solar system with cluster ducts. Um, but to bring this all home again, we don't know what the future holds in the world around us. Uh, the California wildfires alone, I, I still can't believe this is a real photo of people just driving down the highway as an entire mountain is on fire. Hurricane Florence, uh, again, a couple years ago, there will be, on average, 12 hurricanes this year. We've just gotten into hurricane season, so I'm certain we'll be seeing some of these issues in the coming months in the Caribbean and U.S. Atlantic coast. Kerala flooding um, throughout uh, in Asia was uh, uh, particularly devastating uh, recently, and um, we've had several individuals jump into our Slack to talk about this problem as they endured it themselves in the environment and how we might be able to support these communities with technology. And then, of course, natural disasters that many of us didn't even really consider could be happening in 2020. So 
I guess at this point in 2020, we should have just assumed nothing is impossible. But that these things continue to occur, they continue to be devastating, and in some scenarios like hurricanes, they continue to grow in intensity and consistency. And we need to build innovative solutions that can help communities respond to them, particularly in places that don't have many of the things and support structures that we take for granted. So lastly, what's next? Again, we love ideas, criticism, suggestions. If you hate our duck names, if you love our duck names, I want to hear about it. If you have any great ideas, shoot me an email. Uh, we've got electronics. I've got swag, like wonderful t-shirts like this. Um, if any of that's interest to you, shoot me an email with what you're working on. We'd love to support you to get some stuff built and, and see what you guys are thinking about. And um, some current focuses in the, the protocol itself are on security, encryption, network protocols, performance, bandwidth optimization, electronic, uh, bo electronics board independence, so being able to apply the CDP to a limitless uh, number of IoT boards, and then, of course, network setup and initialization. So if any of those are interested to, interesting to anybody who's a developer, we'd love to speak with you. So that's all I got. Thank you very much. You can find slides at www.projectowl.com slash Linux dash OSS dash slides, which I will now link in the chat. I hope I can link this to everybody. But that's all I had. I know we've got a few minutes. I hope uh, I do see some, some – I'm going to put this in the chat here. Uh, there are the slides and uh, Project Owl. I can see some questions. I will get to them. Hopefully, everybody can see the comments. I just... um, okay. So, have I involved ham radio operators in with this effort? Yes, we have. Um, in fact, uh, one of the close groups we're closest to in Puerto Rico is um, ITDRC the Information Technology Disaster Resource Center. Um, and many of them are ham radio operators. We've also connected with ham radio folks in California, talking about resilience as, as electrical and radio networks are going down uh, to prevent the wildfires from, from starting. PG&E was actually shutting down electricity to proactively stop wildfires. Ham radio operators reached out. So we have uh, a lot of relationships with the ham radio community and, um, uh, in fact, one uh, there's a, a, a one of the gentlemen on our team is uh, I forget the word like an official ham radio operator. Um, but if you're a ham radio operator, we would love to talk to you uh, better understand what you do and how we can support your work. But definitely interested in the ham radio community. All right, from David Mandala, um, have you worked with any Arden Mesh radio technology? Yes. Um, David, we, a while ago, someone reached out. I, I shouldn't say yes. We haven't worked extensively, but we did have an AREDN member join our Slack and was talking to us a little bit about how it worked and whatnot. Um, haven't spoken to him in some time, but I would be very interested to reconnect, David, if you want to provide some more information or you have more questions about that. Um, I would love to talk more about the AREDN. And John Gold says Hopslink. Um, okay, so um, we, cre we were doing a product demonstration to a company in North Carolina, and uh, one of the gentlemen in North Carolina had told me he was, uh, he was, a, he was a big a IPA guy, okay, and I've had a, an IPA beer from uh, this place up in Vermont called um, uh, the Alchemist Brewery. It's called Hetty Topper. It's supposed to be like the best in the United States. And one of the things that's cool about it is you can only get it from there. So what we were demoing for this group was they wanted a sensor that could track kind of like climate events, refrigerated containers on oil tankers. So to showcase that, we went up, got this exclusive rare type of IPA, put it in a case, put a hops link in that monitored temperature, pressure, light exposure, humidity, delivered the beer to him on the desk and showed him in real time from the brewery to his desk, all of those metrics that the beer uh, went through. So I could confirm that, that that pharmaceutical equipment arrived on time in constraints of light temperature exposure and, and whatnot. So 
who knows, maybe we'll have an application of that in the future. One can only hope. But I think, okay, David, I got your email. I will copy this down. Thank you. Um, okay, I think that's all the questions. Is there any anything else I need to do? All right, I think that's all we have. Thanks, everybody, for your time. I hope this was valuable. Please connect with me after if there's anything I can do for you. I appreciate all your time again. Take care.